before lunch and mass, I'd like to introduce Pastor Lee Preston. Pastor Lee Preston, along with his wife, Shay, are directors of Shadows of His Wings Ministry. He is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas, as well as a pastor with almost 20 years of experience working with those seeking freedom from same-sex attraction and sexual brokenness. Shadow of His Wings Ministry was formed over nine years ago out of a desire to help the lost and heal the brokenhearted. He comes from a strong belief that Jesus came to set the captive free and therefore freedom from same-sex attraction is possible. He will be speaking about unwanted same-sex same attraction and, and, and provide stories of victory and hope. Thank you for joining us, Pastor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I, uh, I feel like I'm in good company, so I appreciate uh, inviting me here. I am thrilled to share with you today a story of hope and freedom. Uh, my own, as well as my wife, we both came from homosexuality, and the reason why our ministry exists is because we want to help others see that freedom is possible. Now we live in a world today where people question freedom. Uh, if we can't get free, then therefore, perhaps God made us this way. And I'm just offering to you that God would never make someone in sin to have him struggle the rest of his life to get free from a sin that his son died for. So I come to you to offer you some understanding that you may not know. This is, I'm, I'm not Catholic, I'm sorry, I have been to an axe retreat, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> so I hope you'll forgive me for being Protestant, but uh, I believe we're all, we are all warriors in the battle. And so I come to you kind of offering to you some hope for the church. Because as much as I see it in the Protestant church, I also see it in the Catholic church. That this particular issue could very much divide it, if we're not careful. Because it comes down to another decision. Who is God? Am I God? And so therefore, if I can't get free from a habitual compulsive sexual sin, then therefore he must have made me this way. Or perhaps I just haven't found the freedom and the healing he has for me. And so I will just share a little bit of my own story. I grew up in a little town in West Texas. Um, West Texas is a place filled with wonderful people, but I promise you once you see a tree somewhere else, you get decide to stay. <laughs> so I decided to stay here after I found that there were trees in Texas, <laughs> not the little tumbleweeds that roll through, our, through West Texas was raised in a, a home where my parents loved the Lord and wanted us in church every Sunday and had us in church every Sunday. And yet there was a, a bit of a cancer in our home, not even one that, that anyone would have been aware of. But there was pornography in our home. And I just want to start there because if you don't know the dangers of pornography, you should. It may be one of those things that people say, well, boys will be boys. You know what, what's a little porn? But I found pornography at the age of nine years old. And I asked the Lord in my heart at the age of eight. And something he told me one time was, Lee, I saved you at eight because at the age of nine, I knew that everything was downhill from me. Until the day you found freedom. Pornography opens up. This wasn't, I mean, this is your run of the mill pornography. This was Playboy magazines I found. But it changed me. It opened something in my heart that I didn't know how to close. And once that place gets opened to pornography, to compulsive sin, uh, to compulsive self-pleasuring, whatever word, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the M word here, but you know what I'm talking about. When a young boy gets into that place, 
he doesn't know how to get free. So by the time I was 16 years old, I had experienced all kinds of sexuality at that point. And by then I was having sex with other, other males, and I went to my church youth pastor, and I said, you know what, I don't know what to do with this. And I just kind of vomited it out on the table. And he looked me square in the eye and he said, you know, neither fornicators nor idolaters nor homosexuals will enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you don't stop this, you're going to hell. And I said, thank you, and walked away and said, guess I'm going to hell. Because you can't just offer someone, in my opinion, who's stuck in a sin, you can't just tell them it's wrong. Because showing them the law doesn't ever offer freedom. Showing them the law only shows them that they're wrong. It wasn't until about 10 years later, 10 to 12 years later, after I'd been married for nine years, thinking, well, if I got married, things would be okay. It wasn't. Thinking that 10 to 12 years later, I went through a lot of just junk, trying to figure out who I was. And yet I kept being told, you realize you're a sinner and you realize you need to stop. So maybe you should just pray more. And please understand, I have no problem sharing that it's a sin. It is a sin. You cannot press up against the truth of God and expect it to, go, to, to give. God's truth is a golden wall that will not move. So no matter what you do to try to justify sin, he will never let you press in. He will never move his truth. So that was, the, that was a great place for me. Although, since I knew nothing more, I began to grow to hate him. Because I thought, you know what, if you really wanted me to be free, you would have freed me already. So either you're not a big enough God to free me, or you just must hate me. And so when you try to tell someone who struggles in homosexual sin that they've just made a choice, I promise you they're going to say it doesn't feel like a choice. I'm going to promise you that they're going to say, I don't know how to stop feeling this way, which is what I kept struggling with. But I knew I was saved at eight, so I kept thinking, well, was that real? Was it not real? But about 12 years after I spoke to my youth pastor at 16, after I'd lost my first marriage, been arrested for public indecency, I showed up at a, at a men's Bible study, kind of as a last ditch effort. And I walked into this men's Bible study, and the leader of this men's Bible study, his name was Wendell, he's no longer here, he's in the presence of the Lord. But he sat at this kitchen table, and I don't know if you've ever felt the hand of God, but I did. And I felt a bit of a nudge, and I felt God say, you need to tell him what you do. And I said, no, <laughs> not going to do that. By this point, I had moved to Odessa, Texas. I don't know if you know where Odessa, Texas is, but I call it the armpit of Texas. <coughs> It's a great place. I'm not making fun of the folks, but you know they really do hang you up in the town square for homosexuality, that's for sure. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to do that, Lord. I'm sorry. You know, the great thing is, and I want you to also understand this, is all through these years, see, I grew up in a time when homosexuality wasn't popular. Although I may not look 48, I am. I'm just playing. I probably look it. But I was always told that it was wrong. See, our kids today don't have that same luxury. And so I wish there were more people here to look at all of these things and say, we need to fight for truth. But see, since I always knew that it was wrong, I never fully gave into it. Oh, there were times that I said, you know what, after my, my first marriage, I said, forget it. I really must just be gay. Met a great Catholic boy, and we were together for two years, on and off. But the love of God never stopped pursuing me. 
I never stopped having those moments where I thought, is this really all there is? And is this really who I am? And in those moments, I would get real agitated or real angry. There's so much anger in the gay community. Because when you press against the truth of God, he will not move. And you can keep pushing, but you're only going to find yourself getting angrier and angrier at a God who says, you know, I love you, but I'm never going to change. See, homosexuality is just not God's best. It's like all sin. It is not my best for you, child. So whether you've bought the lie and you believe that somehow God made us this way, you can't ever take away my story. I know he never gave, me, he gave it to me, nor did he ever make me this way. So I come to this Bible study, and I'm sitting there, and I feel the hand of God again. Say, I really want you to tell your story. Well, all I could muster is, again, kind of vomiting it on the table and saying, this is what I do and I don't know how to stop. And this is the first place of healing. He looked back at me, this Wendell, the, the leader of this men's Bible study, and he said, you know what, Lee? He said, I don't know the first thing about your sin, but... God can love me in my sin. I can love you in yours. And so you just keep on coming back here, and I will try to help you find freedom. See, it was the first time that nobody told me that I was just a sinner bound to hell. And it was also the first time that somebody said, you know what, if God can love me in all my sin, I can love you in yours. And that's where the change began. That's when I began to see that, you know, I wasn't the worst of the worst. That, yeah, the, the sin I had committed was one of the worst of the worst. But I wasn't. I was a child of the king, bound up in the filth of this world. And so there had to be a way to find freedom. Well, see, I'm a counselor. By this point, I was a counselor. So I kept thinking, you know, there has to be something here because, you know what? God just wouldn't make me this way. And I didn't want to white-knuckle it anymore. You know, I work now. As a matter of fact, I'm, so I have to head right out of here. I have a couples retreat going on right now for men who struggle with, home, with uh, uh, compulsive sexual behaviors and affairs in marriage, and they're trying to save their marriages. So we have couples in Hunt, Texas, sitting here right now trying to find freedom from compulsive sexual behavior, affairs, you know, it's not just an affair. It's brokenness. It's not just porn, it's brokenness. And so what God began to show me is, you know what, I never created these things, and if I didn't create them, then does Jesus not save anymore? No, he saves still. If you should know the truth, and the truth should set you free, then there must be some truth that I didn't know. Oh, I'd grown up in the church. And I'd heard all I knew that there was. But there were some lies deep inside my heart that I didn't know were there. And as I began to work with folks who would help me see those lies and speak into my life, that I began to find that there was something different. You see, as the speakers earlier talked about, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of darkness. And so I personally believe from the day I was conceived in my mother's womb that Satan began a journey of I'm going to destroy his identity. See, sexual sin gets so wrapped around our identity that it actually tries to convince you that this is who you are. Well, if you begin to believe this is who you are, then you're going to begin to act out your sin. See, isn't it interesting? The gay community says this is who we are. If you take that to the end of itself, are we going to have communities of murderers sin and say we are a murdering community? This is who we are. 
We are pedophiles. This is who we are. Now, I'm not trying to scare you, but guess what? We are not in the spirit of fear. We should not live in the spirit of fear, but we should not be asleep any longer. If we don't wake up today and begin to stand for the truths that God has set forward, then we will lose our freedoms. I already work with folks who come to me and say, you know what? I couldn't find anybody who was willing to help me find freedom. I went to a good Christian counselor, and even he told me that that's the way I was born. That God loves me just the way I am. See, that's the subtlety of Satan. Oh yes, God does love us just the way we are, but he can still free us from the sin that so easily entangles us. And if you don't add that peace, then you potentially are condemning people either to hell or condemning them to a life of an unfulfilled calling in Christ. So let's not live in the lie anymore. After I sat in this little house in Odessa, Texas and said my sin and he told me that he could love me still, things began to unravel. All the junk that I had been through and gone through began to unravel. And the grace of Christ came pouring in. You know, the grace of Christ, is the grace of our Father God, who is like the prodigal father, who stands and looks far off and sees me coming. And says, there's my son. He saw me coming. I went running to him, and I still stunk. You know, I stunk of the world. It smelled like the pigs that I'd been slopping in. But the most beautiful thing was, is he didn't run. He stood right there. And he said, I'm glad you've come. Welcome back. The most wonderful freedom, I can't explain it enough. There is no freedom in accepting this as the way I was born. It's only a prison cell. When you tell someone that they're born this way, you have condemned them to a prison cell of a lie of a lie of not their true nature and not their true identity. You've condemned them to a lie. So if you tell them the truth, they may not like it at first. None of us really like those things that, that condemn what we're doing. We all like to have our ears tickled a little bit, right? We prefer just to hear that we're okay. Really, Lee, you're okay. I'm good. But yet God kept telling me this isn't okay. This isn't okay. So I sat down one night in my, in my living room as I was still struggling and I said, you know what, Lord? I do not want to keep white knuckling in. Now I had already been to this Bible study. I had already started getting freedom. I'd already gotten rid of all the porn in my house, got rid of my computer. Actually, I didn't get rid of it. God blew it up, just quit working one night. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? Be careful what you pray for, because your computer might just blow up. <laughs> but truly, I didn't have a computer for almost a year and a half. I didn't have cable for almost a year and a half. And yet I was still struggling in places, struggling to not know what to do. Now, some people would tell me, well, you're just not really saved. And I was the poster child of going down every Sunday saying, please save me. I don't know what to do. Please save me. And you may not believe me, but I know it happened. Jesus sat me down one night and said, Lee, I only saved once. And I did save you. You just have to get the trappings of this world off of you. So you need to keep working and keep looking at the, at the wounds in your heart and you will find freedom because I, I did come to set the captive free. And as I kept working, you know, you have to look at some things, some things you don't like to look at. I had to look at a father wound. As much as my father was a wonderful dad, he was what I call the Archie Bunker dad. Come home from work, he'd sit in his chair, my mom would run in circles trying to take care of him. And I'd say, let's go play baseball. And he'd say, I'm too tired. Well, let's go do this. Well, I'm too tired. Well, let's go do that. Well, I'm too tired. Now, I'm not blaming fathers. I'm a father. 
But all I'm saying is, is it wounded me. It taught me that my dad doesn't really want to be around me. So there was the first lie that began to grow. I don't fit with other men. And so guess what Satan's great alternative, his counterfeit is? Well, go be sexual with men, because if you don't fit, they'll accept you. And I promise you folks, the one thing the gay community will do is they will always accept you. If you're telling them what they want to hear. I had people tell me, you don't need your family. You don't need your God. We are your family now. That's the great division. Everyone over here accepts me. I can do whatever I want. They're the only community that we've separated as a culture. I don't mean as a, as a people, but as a culture, we've separated them out and said, we will give you special class protection simply because of who you have sex with. All because we're afraid to be intolerant and say, you know what, we love you. But you just weren't born that way. We want to help. You know, God does not hate the homosexual. But he does hate homosexual sin. Why? Because it destroys. I can tell you, I was destroyed. God is restored with the locusts of Eden, but I was destroyed. I had lost everything. So if you buy the lie that somehow people are born this way, you're condemning folks to living in destruction. We cannot just keep saying yes because we're afraid to be intolerant. So as I was sitting in my house, that night, after I was still saying, Lord, I want more freedom, I want more freedom. That's when he, he came to me again. He said, this was back in 1990, and he said, um, I don't know if you remember the little book called The Prayer of Jabez. Some of you may have read it, some of you may not. But it was a sweet little book. It talked about the prayer that Jabez prayed about, prayed about enlarging his territory and expanding his tents. And oh, that you would keep me from harm, and that you would keep me from harming others, and that you would bless me indeed. And I said, Lord, can you really do that for somebody like me? And he said, yes. But you have to keep working. Now, he doesn't say you have to work to get your salvation, in my opinion. He just said you have to work to find the junk inside your heart. And it was hard. Nobody likes looking at the junk in, in our heart. But you have to go back to your past to see where it all started. And not many of us like to do that. Most of us just prefer to act like everything's better now. So as I went back to the past and began to get some healing, my attractions changed. Things began to fall off. And I can tell you that was 15 years ago. It was 15 years ago when I started. It was 14 years ago when I read the prayer of Jabez. And I don't have attractions to men anymore. I don't feel attracted to them. I, don't, I haven't been with anybody except my wife in those 15 years. Now, I'll tell you a little story about my wife. I started helping her come out of some brokenness that she was in. I never once spoke to her about lesbianism, although she was in a lesbian relationship for 17 years. When I met her, she had been in a lesbian relationship for 13. All she came to me for is, is just, hey, as a friend and as somebody, and I, I was going to church, and I invited her to church one day. I met her, and I said, why don't you come to church? She said, I don't think people want me there. I said, well, I want you there. So we just started going to church together. We were just friends. I knew that she was in a relationship with a woman. She had raised two of her two children in this relationship. But I promise you folks, I never said a word to her. I never said, you know, this is wrong. You know, because we've been married for seven years, and so I've known her for 12 altogether. So part of this was I was, you know, just freely getting my, some of my own freedom still. 
So I never said a word to her. I just kept taking her to church, just kept giving her, you know, things to, to think about with regards to Christ and how much he loved her. And you don't understand, he's not going to love me. Who's going to love me? He doesn't love me. Well, just try it. Come to church. You know, you don't have to break the, the commandments over somebody's head to keep telling them how much of a sinner they are to get them to heal. You just keep bringing them, and the, the love that pours out of Christ's heart will show them love and healing. I didn't have to. Every day she went to church, every time she saw Christ through others, every time she met with, with him in prayer, and as we begin to pray together, she's the one who came to me one day and said, you know what, for some reason, I just don't think this fits for me anymore. I said, great. So over time, she and the woman that she'd been with for about 17 years ended their relationship. We were still friends. And, so, well, three, three years later is when he shared, he shared with her a year earlier that we were to be married. I was still pretty thick-headed, so I was like, oh, I'm never getting married again. I don't want to go, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to go through this again. And then I was sitting in my house one night, not knowing anything that he had told her, and I heard him say to me, she's the woman I want you to marry. Well, I freaked out, because I'm like, she's going to think I'm nuts. She's going to think I'm crazy. And guess what? I went to her and kind of said, I think we need to talk. God seems to be changing our relationship. She burst into tears, and she said, I was wondering when you were going to finally hear him. <laughs> I never even knew, folks. God does change us. And I just have a heart for people who don't think he does. Because if we don't tell them that he can change them, then who's going to? If we don't stick to the foundations of who God is, then who's going to? The world's idea of God is just, you know, love and be happy and we should just be able to do whatever we want. But the most amazing thing about that is that only leads to hell. And it also doesn't lead to hope. You know what, I wouldn't change a day of what I went through. Because when you can relate to the sufferings of Christ, even though I know mine was my own sin, but I suffered. But when you can relate to the sufferings of Christ and feeling like you're a hopeless cause and he comes in and he says, you know what, I love you. Right where you're at. He met Zacchaeus in the tree. He met Mary Magdalene on the road in her own prostitution. He met the, the woman caught in, the, in adultery right there where she was about to be stoned and he met me right on my road as well. He never once said, Lee, you've got to be better before you can come to church. He said, you just come on and we'll love you. And I'll show you the truths of who you are. And he set the captain free. My wife and I have been married for seven years. And I'm not trying to impress you because we somehow, hey, God made me heterosexual. I want to impress you that God made me free. That's all my impression is for you that he made me free. He can free us from any sin. And it's his will to do that. Sure, sometimes he says, this one I will let you stay in for a little while because it will teach you things. But most of the time he came to set us completely free. And I'm offering to you that God does set people completely free. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to. Yes, sir. Great question. Much of what you say, I see echoes in the book of Peggy Day OK by Robert Riley. So I was wondering if you read it. If you see any of your points echoed in that book, what do you think of it? 
I'm so sorry. I have never read that book, but I'll try to. If you, uh, if you'll, what's the title again? It's the Making Gay Okay. Uh, Robert O'Reilly, published by Nash's Press. And it's not been out too long, but it's been kind of uh, avoided by the conservative media. So, uh, but I find it a very interesting reading, and I was just wondering if you could if you read it. I haven't, but I will certainly look it up. Yes, sir. I'd just like to thank you for your courageous testimony and uh, inspiration. Uh, just echoing part of what you said about barring that is when everybody contemplates, especially uh, within the church hierarchy, uh, how much so many of us, I mean, even though I guess it's the gay lesbian community that took possession of that term, it seems, popularized it. How much the rest of us would love to use that as a plea when we go to confession and so on, that uh, any of the sins against the Ten Commandments or the Eight Beatitudes or, and so on, that we could all, and including sexual sin, you know, we, we could all plead what we were born that way. Bits of anger, uh, you know, heterosexual sin, all these things, we could just plead we were born that way. And, and I've been tempted to do that too. And, and you know, any church uh, official who would lean in the direction of, of, uh, of claiming that you know homosexuals are born that way, that would have, in my mind, in my soul, have to answer about why is that not true about anger, about uh, uh, every every other kind of sin that, that we're, we're taught. In, right. uh, so I just like that thought we contemplated, and thank you very much. You're welcome. And that, that is the most amazing thing to me, and I just, uh, I still have such a heart for folks struggling with homosexuality, because I understand that you, you wake up one day, whether you think it was when you were two, or whether you think it was when you were 10, and all of a sudden you have some attractions to the same sex. It's a scary place. It's a horrible place you're unsure of what to do about it and you don't know who you even are and I don't know too many teenagers that of 10 to 13 years old who even know who they are period but that's the problem with it is it hits at a time when no one really understands who they are but yet in this person who's struggling with homosexual sins life they all of a sudden look up and go wow I don't know what to do with this and so I do feel for them and I understand that when someone would try to tell me, you know, you just need to stop it. You just need to make a choice to not feel that way. I didn't know how to just make a choice to not feel that way. So I understand where a lot of the anger is coming from. Because oftentimes the church itself would say, just stop it. But there was no assistance of how to stop it. And I'm not downing the bride. I'm saying that we didn't always know. It makes us very afraid. Homosexuality creates a lot of fear. What do we do with this? But So I get that there's a lot of hurt there. But I still think if we can offer the truth and love and continue to say, wait a minute, there's something better here, then we offer them something so much more than just the lie that this is who they were born to be. Yes, sir. I'm glad you um, brought up the, uh, the what the what the homosexual act of homosexuals does say that they the common thing they do say is uh, what well, is uh, that they had they've always been attracted them to the same sex since a very early age, two, three, four years old, and so on. And you, you just addressed it a little bit here. Could you? Sure, I'd be glad to. Just hear some more of that particular aspect? Sure. Aspect. It, thank you for your question. I personally have looked at it, and, and, and all the folks I've worked with, you know, if you think about it, our identity, who we are, the, the blueprint of who we are, starts getting formed at a very early age. So even at two and three and four, you know, I worked with one gentleman whose mother was uh, physically abused a lot by her husband. 
And so even at two and three years old, he remembers hating his dad. And if you go back and, and you ask Jesus to show you, he will. And we did. And he remembers at two or three, well, maybe not two, but maybe more like three or four. He remembers making a vow in his own mind and his heart that I will never be like him. So therefore, I will never be a man. And so he became very connected with his mother. She was also his close confidant. She turned to him because her husband was abusive. And so he over-identified with the female. And so as he began to heal that, he found great freedom. So sure, some people will look back and say, I've just always been this way, or I've always felt this way. I know I felt different from the age of five or six. But it was because of the socialization in our home. I too, at some point, God showed me where I had said, I don't want to be around my dad because he doesn't seem to want to be around me. But when my mom would say, hey, who wants to go to the grocery store? Hey, I'll go. I hate going to the grocery store now, but back then, I would go because that was my identity. That's what I, it was the only place I could find. So I over identified with her. So to say I remember I was born this way, not many of us have memories from two and three years old. So I, I usually challenge that and say, are you sure you might not have memories from four or five? You know, I had one female that my wife and I worked together with and she said, oh no, I remember. I was like four, I think. And I always wanted to be the groom when my sister and I would play getting married. So, so you want to be the groom? Maybe you didn't like the white dress you always had to put on. Who knows? But she began to look at that and realize that maybe it wasn't that she was actually born that way. See, Satan loves to tell us a lie and then make us believe that's who we are. He does that in all sin. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. God bless you. And uh, may we all join the fight together to, to win back our, our hope and our freedom in this country. There's stuff back on the table if you want it. I'm sorry I got to cut out of here. So, uh, well, before we uh, take a short break to set up for mass, I want to let you know I found the through Father Joseph Mary Marshall. Maybe many of you probably know him, right? I'm saying Mary. She knows badly with cancer. I know he was out of town in October. He says, well, "Call, call me. You know, you know uh, invite him." And uh, there was another. Therapist's name is Dr. Uh, Dr. David Pickup. He's in uh, he's in Dallas, and he was planning to come, but when we changed the date of the conference, he couldn't make it. But I will tell you, folks, right now, as we're meeting here, there is a homosexual friendly workshop going on at Our Lady of the Lake University. Al Knotson and I, as the leaders of Texas Mutual Coalition, petitioned the president of LU to stop it. They had one several months ago. This is the second one. They are giving professional credits to counselors to come to that day-long work workshop. Tomorrow, I will blog about this. If I don't have your email, leave it at the registration table, and I will, I will direct you to the link of the workbook that they are providing at that Catholic University. And one of the reasons why you're here, why we call this conference, is because we, there's not many of us here, but it's up to us. We have to call attention to these evils within our church. Now, we sent a copy of the letter to the Archbishop, to the Papal Nuncio, and to Bishop Sartain, who's, look, who has been given the authority by the Pope to monitor the religious orders. But this problem is very deep in our, in our society here in San Antonio. And the other thing is, if any of you have a heart to advance the cause of the Courage Ministry, which is a beautiful ministry, similar to Lee's ministry within the evangelical ranks. Have any of you heard of Courage? Some of you have. You know, it was founded by 
God bless him. One of the founders was Father Benedict Rochelle in New York, who recently passed away. God bless him. So here's here's a holy priest that we can we can we have an advocate in heaven, I believe. Okay, because he had a real heart for this ministry as a psychiatrist. But anyway, it's a very serious problem in San Antonio. I talked to Father Joseph Mary about uh, getting the courage jump start, uh, uh, ministry jump started here. Right now it's on the ropes because he's sick and there's no one else who's willing to do it. We need a good chaplain. If you are friends with any priest who wants to start, who wants to start, who desires to start a courage ministry, let's get it started. Why don't we take a short break and then we'll set up for a mass. God bless you all.